good evening to all of you hope you hear me yes yes i can hear you yeah um thank you for all of you for joining this webinar you have joined with the uh, slma webinar series that we have been organizing uh, to update you on topics that are of uh, uh, I mean, uh, relevant data of relevance uh, on incidents that are happening into our day-to-day -day, uh, 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 life. Uh, so today we have gathered here for the webinar on mycotoxins and human health. We all know that recently aflatoxin became a very uh, a common topic, uh, a topic of uh, um, interest to uh, all medical professionals, as well as for the business community, as well as for ordinary people, uh, because of the issue that, were, uh, that was uh, detected to have aflatoxin in the coconut oil that was imported. So based on that, there was an interest among uh, medical professionals with regard to mycotoxins. And we thought the, from the SLMA, we thought that the uh, uh, it it was the um, ideal time uh, for us to discuss on this particular topic uh, uh, and the health effects of mycotoxins uh, on humans. So we have uh, invited two eminent speakers to address this important topic uh, uh, to our gathering. Uh, the we have uh, Dr. Upali, uh, Professor Upali Samarajiva. Uh, who is the Emeritus Professor in Food Science and Technology. Uh, if I could introduce uh, uh, Professor Samarajiva, uh, he holds a bachelor's degree in chemistry from the Faculty of Science, uh, Science and a PhD degree in microbiology from the Faculty of Medicine, University of Peradeniya. Uh, he served in the academic staff of the Faculty of Agriculture from 1981 to 2012 and uh, spent his sabbatical uh, as a UNDP fellow uh, at the Tropical Products Institute London and a senior Fulbright Hayes Research Scholar and adjunct professor at the University of Florida, USA. Uh, professor Samarajiva is a very distinguished researcher on particularly on aflatoxin in coconut products since 1972. Uh, and he has supervised many PhD students and has uh, more than 200 research publications to his credit in uh, both local and international peer reviewed journals. Uh, Professor Samarajeva is the founder head of the Department of Food Science and Technology at the University of Peradeniya, founder public analyst in the City Analyst Laboratory in Kandy, and the live wire behind establishing the bachelor's degree in food science and technology in the Faculty of Agriculture. Uh, he is a past president of many organizations, including the Institute of Chemistry Ceylon in 1999, the Sri Lanka Association for the Advancement of Science in 2000, and the Institute of Food Science and Technology Sri Lanka in 2009, currently owing to COVID travel restrictions, actually, he addresses us from Canada. So let me uh, very warmly welcome uh, Dr. Upali, Sam Professor Upali Samarachiva uh, to this gathering. And uh, may I invite you to make your presentation, Professor Samarachiva. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank yes. you, Dr. Gundratna. Yes. I am really thankful to you, right. to the Sri Lanka Medical Association, and especially to Dr. Renuka Jayati sir, for giving me this opportunity to share my, my views on the question of mycotoxins in human health in relation to the Sri Lankan situation. While I am moving into this, this title, let me get into the PowerPoint. Now, the problems of our mycotoxins are surrounded three organisms, namely the aspergillus, which is producing aflatoxins and other toxins. 
the penicillium, which you get in the right hand side of the slide, which is producing a variety of mycotoxins, which are of importance to the human food chain. And thirdly, fusarium, which is less important from a Sri Lankan point of view, but it's more important from the Western point of view because it grows very much in the grains produced in the temperate countries. So my emphasis today, therefore, will be on these three and other related mycotoxins and finally moving into aflatoxins. So if you look at the mycotoxins as such, as a group, we would realize that the topmost one, which everybody talks about today and which you are talking about for many, many years is aflatoxins, which is, uh, okay, which is a hepatocarcinogen on chronic exposure and which is, which is toxic at high doses at acute level. Then comes ocratoxins, which is becoming a little more important now. You will see the reason as we go down. And it is reported to be nephrotoxic, hepatotoxic, teratogenic, immunotoxic to certain animals. And there's a lot of evidence that it affects the kidney and liver tumors, cause the kidney and liver tumors on experimental animals. Then we have patulin, which is more related to apple products, apple juices, and it's reported to be carcinogenic and cytotoxic. Then we have deoxinivalinol, which causes temporary nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and a whole series of uh, things that you will see on the slide. Then we have the T2 toxin having similar effects, which is coming mostly through inhalation and seralinol. I must say at this point, the list of mycotoxins runs to about 100. The list of fungi producing mycotoxins is beyond 60. But we are not going to talk about everything. And nowhere in the world we have discussions on this subject beyond the research interest. But when it comes to human health and regulatory interest, the number one priority is aflatoxin B1. And ocratoxin is becoming an important one in relation to some of our products. Patulin is essentially an outside one and so on. So let us look at a little more detail what these toxins are. When it comes to <coughs> aflatoxins, there are two species, two main species, parasiticus and flavors. The flavors produces aflatoxins B1 and B2. Parasiticus produces B1, B2, G1, and G2. Now in the right-hand side, I have given you the summary of the regulations from different situations. Therefore, I have given you a range. So it's the codex, it's the FDA, and all that put together so that you can get an idea about what kind of range we are talking about. So I am talking throughout using the PPB level or micrograms per kilogram level. I might use these two words, but they both means the same thing during this discussion. Then, then we get to Aspergillus ochracius and several penicillium species, which is producing ocratoxin A. And that seems to be even more serious than aflatoxins, looking at the codex limits for it. But fortunately, ocratoxin is not very much present in Sri Lanka. Another important aspect is Aspergillus flavors and parasiticus is yellow on the third day of growth on any food substance and turns most green, whereas Octasius also light yellow on growth and turns into a rather light green color and not the most green color. So that's the way to distinguish between the two, two toxins, which you can see in copra quite often. Then we have various penicillium toxins, which I have listed. So patulinum is one, uh, patulin is one, and that has a limit of 50. Then we have a whole series of fusarium toxins. You can see the limits are much higher, which means the toxicity levels are different from aflatoxin. So comparably, aflatoxin is the serious one. Second place come taken by the ocratoxin, and down the line, there are so many which is coming up. There will be new regulations coming up in certain countries, in certain communities, in certain export products, especially in relation to the purchase of these products by the European Union and the other countries. So with that broad 
understanding of that. Let me tell you a little of chemistry. I don't want to take you through hardcore chemistry, but we always talk about B1, B2, G1, and G2. B1 and B2 represents the blue fluorescence under UV light, and G1 and G2 represents the green fluorescence under UV light. So let us concentrate on B1, the most toxic one. Now this molecule has a very special character, the double bond here, which opens up and goes and binds into the guanine molecules in the DNA. And that's the place where it triggers the carcinogenic activity. So when it comes to B2, it doesn't have the double bond, therefore the effect is very much less. I must say that the effects of this part of the molecule, the left part of the molecule is controlled by the right part of the molecule. So when it comes to G1, we have the double bond, therefore it has the toxicity more than B2. But when you come to G2, it doesn't have the double bond and also it has this six member ring against the five member ring here. So basically what we need to understand is this whole molecule participate in our carcinogenic activity and on the toxic, toxic problems we are going to run into. Now from B1, we come down to M1. If we consume B1, it will appear in our milk. It will appear in the milk of cows and so on. If you look at this, the B1 and M1 structurally, there's only one difference. You get an OH group here, which I will explain as we go down the importance of that. And therefore there is a very similar toxicity between the two. Then we come to B2A, which is found in the urine of humans, if we consume B1, and that's way of very low toxicity. Then looking at it from the angle of the industry, the chemist, people have tried to do various things to this molecule to break it down so that our food is safe. But this molecule is so resistant, it's very hard to break it down. I worked with chlorine with this molecule in USA. I was able to get this compound, dichloro compound, but unfortunately, the moment you consume this dichloro consume, uh, consume this dichloro compound, immediately it is converted back to B1. So we are back to zero. Then people try to use sodium metabisulfite, which is very commonly used in the food industry for various purposes. We get the adapt of this one, but it breaks down on consumption. Then people try to use alkali hydro hydrolysis, which is use of sodium hydroxide and or ammonia. Now with ammonia, there was good success in relation to animal feeds. Actually, there were two plants established, one in Pakistan, one in Tanzania, to bring about the breakdown of aflatoxins in animal feeds, but it did not run successfully for more than three or four years. There were failures, failures because they were not able to maintain the moisture levels, temperatures, pressures necessary to keep this going. On the other hand, alkali hydrolysis is, an, is a successful one because it breaks down this molecule and take away this component. The right-hand part of the molecule is taken away and therefore the toxicity it is reduced quite a lot. Then the next alternative is we have the UV radiation or solar degradation using sunlight, which breaks down this molecule further. So there's prospects for us here. There's no prospect for, with, for us with all the other chemical treatments. So they have for, we have to either think of preventing it at the regulatory level or bringing about something like alkaline hydrolysis when it comes to coconut oil, which I'll be discussing later towards the end of my presentation. Now, there are two aspects which we look at it. First, the toxicity, and second, the mutagenicity. So the toxicity is established through animal experiments. Mostly we use ducklings, one day old ducklings or brine shrimps, or in Sri Lanka, we develop the tadpole bioassay to establish the toxicity and carcinogenicity of the experimental animals. When it comes to mutagenicity, most of the mutagenicity work is done by the AIMS test, where you, we use a revert, reversion of the activity by a selected species, a subspecies of Salmonella trifumurium. So these are the two aspects that we look at it, at aflatoxins. So among the aflatoxins, B1 is the of highest toxicity and which is of concern to us. Then we go to B2, which is in the second line. 
is 2.4 times less toxic and 500 times less mutagenic. We go to G1, which is 1.6 times less toxic. It is weakly mutagenic, sorry, uh, 30 times less mutagenic. And G2 is of low toxicity and it is not carcinogenic. So now from the point of view of an analyst, the chemist, he will love to talk about B1, G, B2, G1, G2. But from a point of view of a medical person, from a toxicologist, we have to look at it differently because toxicities of B2, G, G1, and G2 are much less than that of aflatoxin B1. And in any mixture, you will find that B1 is 60%. And there are mixtures naturally where there is only B1 and B2, and there are other mixtures where there is only there is B1, B2, G1, and G2. So we are in a mixed situation. From a toxicological point of view, I would prefer to talk about aflatoxin B1 rather than the total aflatoxins because it does not reflect the true picture of toxicology in relation to the aflatoxins in foods. Then we come down to M1. It is, it is three times less carcinogenic to rainbow trout, but the toxicity is of the same order as aflatoxin B1. Productive. So that, that's the thing which sensitizes us in relation to the milk production in any country. <clears throat> and also it is 30 times less mutagenic compared to aflatoxin B1. Then we have B2A, 200 times less toxic, 1000 times less mutagenic. P1, which is present in urine and sometimes in dairy products, arising from B1 again, uh, it is 15 times less toxic, thousand times less mutagenic. And Q1, again, which is found in uh, beef, and it's 18 times less toxic when you do the chick embryo assay, and 83 times less mutagenic. So I think from the Sri Lankan point of view, our first preference should be to aflatoxins. And within the group of aflatoxins, we should think about B1, because you see a footnote down there, the concentration of B1 in foods is more than the total of B21. B2 plus G1 plus G2. And the toxicities of B2, G1, and G2 are less than B1. Therefore, B1 is a better regulatory criterion than the total aflatoxins when it comes to food. So why are we worried about aflatoxins is a question. Now on chronic exposure, it's a hepatocarcinogen, and there's epidemiological correlation between the degree of exposure of certain African populations to moldy foods and incidence of hepatocarcinoma. That's very well established, perhaps about 40 years back. Then also, there's correlation between the aflatoxin B1 albumin adduct in the sera and the human exposure to moldy foods. Then we get a very interesting case, a case study in Uganda where a 15-year-old child consuming about 146 micrograms per kilogram of aflatoxin B1 for three weeks died of liver failure. Now this one gives some very important, interesting information to us. Let us remember throughout the discussion today for the next half an hour that 146 or rather 150 is a vital figure. 150 of aflatoxin B1 is a vital figure for us and exposure to three weeks. Then we have the other example, Indian case, where 105 people it died in 1974 due to consumption of maize during a famine. And the food seems to have contained up to 16,000 micrograms per kilogram. And the people have consumed 2,000 to 6,000. Now, if you look at these figures, against the figures that we saw during the last two, three weeks, we were talking about hundreds, not even thousands. So we cannot take this example as a real risk to our people. But the previous example, the Ugandan case, tells us something to ring the bells in our minds. Then we have the Kenyan case. Again, the exposure levels were 1,000 to 46,400 micrograms per kilogram. So we need to put our levels, our exposure, in relation to what has been happening elsewhere the calculated toxic dose for B1 is in the range of 20 to 120 micrograms per kilogram per body weight, kilogram of body weight over a period of one to three weeks, which could create the problem. 
So we need to now start thinking, what actions can we take to prevent our food delivering this level of aflatoxins for a period of one to three weeks? That's, that's a real question we have in our mind at the moment. Then also it's known exposure to hepatitis B virus, also to pre-existing liver conditions can damage the liver, liver damage with damaged liver can increase the aflatoxicity to humans. Now this I take from a very recent study. I myself has not understood this fully. Let me be very frank about it. The risk assessment of aflatoxin B1 in dietary carcinogenic potency. They have calculated the potential to have cancer by aflatoxin B1. You can see at the bottom of the slide. And they consider it as a function of seropositive HBS antigen plus and HBS antigen minus, AG plus and AG minus. And they have worked out this table based on the seroprevalence data from all the countries, including Sri Lanka in the WHO system. So let us look at the second column. It gives the maximum tolerance limits in each country, irrespective of this study. Now, Sri Lanka has a limit, but unfortunately, it has not got across to the system. So the limit at that time, at least, we should say 30. Or if you talk about the SLSI limit, standards institution limit, it's 10. So they look at what is the maximum le allowable level of aflatoxin B1 to ensure the safety. So if you get, if you allow 14, up to 14, we can allow, if you allow up to 14, micrograms per kilogram in our food exposure, the risk is one in one million. If we allow 138, the risk is one in 10,000. So we have to decide what layer of risk can we achieve or are we willing to achieve? Can we get zero risk? That never happens. That never happens with our food. So therefore, let us be very frank and let us think about the in these terms. It might be important for us to compare our uh, values with that of India. Indian limit is 30 and their values are 13 and 129, which is quite close to ours. Yeah. Then we look at the values in Tanzania. Of course, I must say the food cluster for Tanzania is different from the food cluster for all the other countries listed here, according to the WHO definitions. So Tanzanian situation may not be very comparable, but there is something for us to learn. That is, they have gone to the limit of 10 and their incidence is two and 16. So we need to study this further. I think somebody in the medical profession will be able to make use of this data and apply it to Sri Lankan situation and try to work out realistically, how are we going to decide on carcinogenic potency due to aflatoxins? Now this table comes from the information in relation to peanuts and uh, maize. Our situation is different because we are not exposed to that much of peanuts or maize, but we are exposed quite a lot to the coconut oil, same levels as peanut, I should say. So therefore we need to take this table take this information and interpret it in relation to the Sri Lankan situation. Having said that, let me summarize the actual situation we have seen with coconut oil. In 73, we found the mean value is 50 on analysis with 160 samples. I have problem in analyzing this data here because some people talk about aflatoxin B1, others talk about the total aflatoxin. Many people don't like to give the distribution of the toxin levels in relation to different ranges. They give a mean and a standard deviation, which does not take us anywhere. From their point of view, from the point of view of publication, from the point of view study of statics, that's fine. But from the point of view of regulations, it's not going to take us anywhere. Having said that, let me look at, let us look at the situation with rice. Rice situation is we could be quite happy because there's almost no aflatoxin in rice. We had 12 samples of, at 30 level. 
We had six samples at 12 to 13 level. Now, when I look at, when we did this survey, we went from boutique to boutique, shop to shop, and talk to the people. And what we realized is, when we compare the cefalotoxin levels against the moisture levels in rice, which was around 14.7, we are quite safe. And also the boutique people say, the shop people say, generally the rice does not remain in the market for more than seven days, maximum 10 days, very rare occasions. Therefore, there is no opportunity for rice to absorb moisture from the environment and get contaminated to create a problem to us. That's why our survey showed a very good situation in relation to aflatoxin B1 in rice. Getting to peanuts, I must thank the MOH or the Candy Municipality because we ran into this problem with all the peanuts in, on sale in candy contaminated heavily with aflatoxins. We had similar levels in Colombo, but there was no aflatoxins in peanuts in gold. So the MOH used the food advisory documents, used the food law to prohibit the sale of these products. Then I called all the people who are processing these uh, peanuts and gave them a big heap of peanuts and asked them to sort out the healthy ones, shrunken ones, and the immature ones and analyzed them separately for aflatoxins and showed them, if you have the healthy ones, there is no aflatoxins in the market. So they were allowed after three weeks by the municipality, by the authority of the MOH to put back things into market, but we were following it and we found that the levels came down and almost all the samples are below the tolerance limit of 30. So we have mechanisms to control. We need to address at the root of the problem and not the testing at the final end. Come to next one, coconut oil 2019. The data is here, two to 37 total aflatoxins, 12 out of 32 examples. I'll be discussing this in the next slide, so I don't want to go into details on it. Then we have another report in 2020, which is not published yet, which reports 0 0.4 to 600 in 58 to 85 samples and 10% of the samples comply with regulations. Now, again, very unfortunate thing here is all these uh, authors, they try to compare the standards with EU regulations. Now, we cannot talk about EU regulations because EU has developed over many years and they have changed their regulations every three, four years to get at the strict regulations. So we cannot jump, in, jump into EU regulations tomorrow from where we are now. So we have to first think about what our regulations, what we can accommodate, what our industry can produce under very good manufacturing conditions and under control, and then think about the regulations. Then we come down to milk. Again, they found there were eight samples out of 87 samples tested above the limit of 0.5. So that is again something we need to be mindful about. Come down to maize. They have tested 60 samples, 15 were above the level of 60 to 70, about the tolerance level, level having 60 to 70. So at that point, let us consider tolerance levels for Sri Lanka is 30 for the moment. Then there were 20 samples having less than 20 and 23 samples which did not have a protoxin. So that's the true picture that we get from various research that has been carried out in Sri Lanka during the last few years or the whole, whole life of aflatoxins, if I say, put it that way. Then we can look at it from another angle. What happens to our exports in the EU? It tells, when you go through the export figures, I'll, I'll present another slide later. We have problems with chili powder and spice powder, and we have problems with rice. But the levels for rice are three to 15, marginally tolerance level. Chili powder, we have a different problem because we are depending on chilies from India, which is heavily contaminated with aflatoxins. We get them here, we grind them, we export them as Sri Lankan chilies. And we all consume it as Sri Lankan chilies. Now that's where we are getting exposed. Now, get at that paper on 2019. They have tested samples from supermarkets and shops in Candy and Colombo. They have tested 16 branded and 16 unbranded co coconut oils. And out of these 32, 
12 are contaminated and they say five of the brine red oils have aflatoxin levels of 11 to 37, which is above the tolerance limit in any case. And the mean is 37. That's branded. Then we have the unbranded ones, two to 61, mean eight. So this result is a little confusing because branding is done with the high expectation that they will put out much better quality uh, oil than the unbranded one where we cannot find the origin of the oil. They also tested palm malain, sunflower oil, five, five samples each, sesame oil, olive oil, soya bean oil, and corn oil, and all were negative. So in the light of that observation, yes, I see a validity in the results for aflatoxins in coconuts against the other data, as well as what has been happening in the country. So I cannot go beyond that on this paper because I cannot get the breakdown of the samples. Now I have tried to put together two studies. 1973 study with 166 samples of, of uh, coconut oil from the mills. 2020 study with 25 samples from the shops. They were looking at total aflatoxins. The first study was looking at aflatoxin B1. And we have the two standards here, Sri Lankan standards, SLSI standard, and the FAC standard. I understand that it is going to be revised very soon if it has not happened already. Anyway, let, let's stick to the standards we have. Now I have converted this into percentages because I cannot compare 25 against 166. It's meaningless. So when you take the different ranges, zero to 10, 10 to 20, sorry, this is the system was not allowing me to put 10 there. 20 to 30, 30 to 40, like that, and comes to 100 to 200 and more than 200. Now we see the blue bars. This bar actually represents this area also because at this point, we never had the analytical facilities to go below 20. So the values here represent partly the values that may have come as zero to 10. So if you take half this line, it's equivalent to the brown line. Take this line, go ahead, step by step, comparing the two lines in 73 situation, against the 2020 situation. Now we come here, we have a big problem. There's a big jump in the number of samples having levels of 100 to 200. And even a bigger number of, bigger jump in samples having the levels of 200 and more. To my mind, the blue lines represent the kind of local aflatoxin situation in coconut oils, because in 1973, we were not importing. But what we see today, what this study has shown, perhaps they did this analysis in 2019. At that time, we were not aware that there was imported coconut oil and, and what is happening. The whole thing came out only this year. So there had been a question of exposure at this level. Now I ask you to remember the magic figure, 150. So here we are. We have shot above the magic figure of 120. So that is where we have to get alarmed. That is where we have to get take actions to prevent this happening further. Then there's another situation which I need to bring to your notice. When you go to the village, you can see people drying a, a coconut like this. Now these coconuts are extracted in small mills against the commercial mills. The commercial mill is a large mill and they call it the Anderson Expeller. The small mill has a different name, which I'm reluctant to tell now, but you may misunderstand it, but let me tell it for the fun of it, it's called the baby expeller. So with the baby expeller, we see the aflatoxin levels are very high compared to the commercial mills. Now, the commercial mills are in coconut triangle and a few along the southern coastal belt. The small mills are all over the country, even in Andhradapur. I got this uh, uh, picture at Tambuttegawa roadside. So there is a case where the medical officers of health and the public health inspectors have to think very seriously about this kind of sun drying and extraction of coconut oil by the small mills. 
and it is more serious because it is the same family or a few group of people in that surroundings who will be using this same oil and getting exposed to levels about a magic figure of 150. So we need to be very serious about it and we need to see how we can look after it. We may, I may come down to this situation further down. We have seen similar problems in Kenya where people were using home dried, meaning sun dried, and home stored maize, which were having high levels of aflatoxin. So it gives a signal to us. We have a problem in the pipeline. We need to be careful about it. Now this gives us the idea about various food items rejected during the last few years, the levels of aflatoxins in them, and the country and the, uh, uh, the, the rejection. Now this tells us the common problem we have here is the rice and the chilies or spices. So we have a problem with export spices. We have a problem with export rice because people are packeting the rice in airtight bags, perhaps with high moisture levels, and that's allowing the moldy mold spores already present in the rice, which cannot grow in the at low level, at low moisture level of about 14.5%. But with time, there's moisture accumulation and then they will be gone. So that's another issue which we need to think about mycotoxins. Then I want to take you through these regulations of aflatoxin M1 in milk. In 1988, there was an effort by the world bodies to bring down the aflatoxin levels in milk in the African countries from the level existing at that time to a lower level. At this particular meeting, an Indian scientist calculated and showed, if we do that, there will be no milk available for African children to drink, and they will rather die of malnutrition than aflatoxicosis. So they postponed it. So we have now the question of USA and codex regulations against the European regulations. Because of this discrepancy, a committee was appointed the Joint Expert Committee on Food Additives was asked by the codex to look into this and report. And what their report is, says is, with worst case assumptions and based on projected risks of liver cancer attributable to M1 in milk, there is no significant benefit when you bring down it from 0.5 to 0.05 micrograms per kilogram in the food regulation. So the Regulatory authorities need to think about this very seriously and also need to be mindful about the fact Sri Lanka is dependent totally on import milk powder and import milk powder meets these regulations. It meets 0.05 microgram. But what about the local milk? So we might create a situation where the local milk cannot be consumed by certain groups of the population. And then my worry is there are gentlemen within the medical profession, who comes out against the powdered milk. Then we get into a very, very complex situation. Therefore, I think we need to be very, very careful in deciding on the limits, considering the pluses, minuses, what could be achieved by the industry and what is necessary for the country. So the question, the broad question that we have to answer is, how do we address this health issue? The cost of testing aflatoxin is rupees 10,000 to 20,000 per sample by HPLC. Who is going to do it? Who is going to spend on, on this? And we cannot take decisions on the results of one sample. We may have to do 10 samples or hundreds of samples. Can we afford? So the testing is not the option that we can think about. We can use the existing provisions under the Food Act, Amendment of 2011, which introduced the store substances deleterious to health in the food. So all the aflatoxin problems in Sri Lanka are associated with copra, I should say 90%. And copra is visible with fungus. So it's quite easy for the regulatory system to take steps at the level of the storage to ensure that all the contaminated copra is burned. We did it with uh, dal one month back at Valigama. I don't know whether that dal contained aflatoxins or not. That's a second issue. 
but we, we, we destroyed all that. So there is room. If you start doing that, this has to be done only in the coconut triangle and the, and the coastal belt, southern coastal belt. We will address the problem at least 80%. So we have a solution. I must say, when it comes to designing microbiological regulations, the first principle is, it says, if you have a regulation already available to control the problem, don't go for a microbiological regulation because it's costly. Now, this one is also in a way microbiological because aflatoxins is produced by a microorganism. So therefore, my suggestion, my feeling is that the issue should be addressed at the control level, preventive level at the, before the uh, oil is expelled. So the question that comes out is, we are putting everything on the hands of the public health inspectors. Unfortunate guys, they are doing an excellent job with COVID-19. Can we saddle them with it? I don't know. Then also there's a CAA directive on labeling of coconut oil. This gives at least the opportunity for us to test the product and catch the person who is involved in it. Unfortunately, I repeat the word unfortunately, you can find the words in between it. One of the brands that reported to contain 600 micrograms per, per kilogram was a branded one here, unfortunately. Next. I take this slide because at the last discussion we had with a large number of people, one of the industrialists brought in, in a case and he said, we can do the physical refining and bring down the aflatoxin levels. So I asked him to send me the article. It was a 1960s article, which I had. I thought he had some new information. What really happened was when you look at that article, in that study, they have brought down the levels from 120 to 10 by chemical refining, you're using sodium hydroxide, or 814 to 14 by using sodium hydroxide. And then they have done the physical refining. So there's a mix up of understanding right now in the country. We have the bottle saying RDB, refined, deodorized, bleached. That refers to physical refining and not chemical refining. At the moment, we don't have a single plant in Sri Lanka that could refine the oils chemically. There are people in, is interested in starting, but they, they, are, they are reluctant for various political reasons. So we need to start thinking about refining. And also when it comes to the regulations, we have to give a special place for chemically refined. Just don't say refining because they will, they will misinterpret interpret the word and use the RDB to get across. So if you have tolerance limit of 10, which I'm hoping we are going towards, then going below 10 years is possible with chemical refining, right? We can get at this and then we can do it, do the RBD in the next time. So at least we are avoiding this very high exposure if you bring down the levels to here. So our aim, our aim there should be for the coconut industry or any other oil industry in Sri Lanka to bring down the levels here by chemical refining and there is no other way out. Next comes the question asked by many people. The last column here tells you, whatever we do, we cannot get rid of aflatoxins. The loss is 50%, 60%, 80%. With the microwave technology, we can go to 95, but we don't have, no, nowhere in the world, microwave technology was successful in applying it industrially. There are other problems with it. So we cannot go for kilowatt six industry plants. We can only use the home, home, home microwave machine, which is working at 0.6 to one kilowatt. So that is not good enough for us to do the removal of the aflatoxin. So, Heating or anything else is not going to help us. The next thing we can do, which is very useful to the people, is we can expose the coconut oil in a flat bottom to sun. If you expose it at the levels of 70 to 80 parts per, parts per billion, in two hours, it will come down to tolerance limits. These two hours, which I have worked with, was in the morning from eight to nine, like nine to 10. If you go to midday, it's more efficient. I had much more trials with very high levels of aflatoxins working at midday and it could bring it down to 20. So the best option, the best solution we could give to the public at the moment is please keep your oil, perhaps preferably in a flat bottom, a flat bottle and expose it to sunlight. 
if you can keep the bottle forever near your glass window or seal window near where you get sunlight, in, in two, three days, the levels will come down. So that's the immediate solution because today, public are confused. They don't know whether there is aflatoxin or not. I don't know either. So the only way is to advise everybody to do this and try to feel comfortable that your aflatoxins are reported. Now, this is a process which we patented many years back. After we painted it, is nobody was interested. This is to send the oil through a escalating system with a layer thickness of two millimeters. Now there are two industries interested in taking this up and scaling it up with various other modern additions. I have said, yes, I'm very positively thinking about it. That's something we have, have for the future. Then let us come down to a document I submitted to the director of the FSC. My recommendations to the authorities on the aflatox aflatoxin B levels for different foods. Now I have arrived at this by look at, looking at all the processes that's happening in Sri Lanka, by looking at how the GMP, good manufacturing practices can bring down the levels, by looking at the international regulations, by looking at what is, what is achievable. This document running into 10 pages, I'm sure it will be available with Dr. Sirivadana. If not, I'm very willing to send it. So we need to think about this aspect. Then again, I must say, pardon me for saying this, I came across a document this morning, which is in circulation, which is said to be a document produced by the FAC about the mycotoxins in foods. Now, looking at this document, I was rather shocked to say, what are the things listed there? Start with peanuts, then almonds, pistachio, then comes down to edible oils. There was not a single word about coconut oil in the Sri Lankan standards that is being discussed for mycotoxins. We have standards for all these less important ones, Sierra Leone and so on. Totally my impression, pardon me for saying this, is this is a copy of a regulation from another country. This is under discussion. And I believe we will have an opportunity to discuss, to discuss this. The second point I want to make is there is a list of organizations to which this is to be sent. But unfortunately, the Institute of Food Science and Technology is missing. Institute of Food Science and Technology is the only organization with all the professionals in the universities and the senior industrialists who understand science working together. And that institution has been working with the UN body on various projects. I would appreciate if that organization is invited to be a partisan in discussing this document. Then I'll just take 30 seconds to put another idea across to you. All these nice decorative things behind in the screen tells us about the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which contains one of the most highly carcinogenic compound called benzoepyrene. Benzoepyrene has been found in our foods. And what is important is I'm not going to go into details because we, are, uh, we have little time, I believe. We have three for copra, 12 for coconut oil, and one for punet. 102 for copra, 68 for punet, and 359 for coconut oil. There's a big problem. pH is coming from smoke. That's what people believe. But when I did study, I found it's not coming only from smoke. It is coming from the expeller process where the expulsion of oil occurs around 120 to 170 degrees Celsius. This problem prevented us exporting the virgin coconut oil two years back. Now those small machines, which are kind of tabletop models, are cooled by a water aid circulation system at 50 degrees Celsius to look after this problem. So we have a problem in the pipeline a problem of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, more in coconut oil than the foods that we consume. So that's an, something to be addressed that will come up in 10 years to type in time, but let us be ready about it. And finally, let me thank you all and also inform you, make use of this platform to inform. There'll be a presentation on polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons on the 24th, organized by the Institute of Food Science and Technology. You can get the link with from Chamodika Sinarat, or the link is given down here. So it's free for anybody to participate.
Thank you all for giving me this time and listening to me. And I'll be very happy to discuss anything towards the end of the presentation or the, the end of the seminar. Thank you again, the Sri Lanka Association, Medical Association for giving me the opportunity. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Samarachiva. Uh, I see that there are many questions in the chat box. I wonder whether we should discuss the other uh, uh, presentation and then to move on to questions. Uh, so let me introduce uh, uh, Dr. Tilak uh, Sirvadana. Uh, Dr. Tilak Sirvadana is the Director of Environment and Occupational Health, Ministry of Health, Sri Lanka. Actually, uh, he is a very experienced administrator. Previously, uh, he graduated in 1986 and then worked as a medical officer for a fairly long period and then became the regional director in charge of two districts, Colombo and Monragala, and then uh, became the med medical administrator with experience of 17 years. Uh, and I could remember that he was the director in CD um, two years ago. Now he is the director in Environment and Occupational Health, Ministry of Health. He would be uh, presenting to us on existing regulatory mechanisms in Sri Lanka. So uh, let me uh, invite Dr. Tilak Sirivadan to make his presentation. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, Tilak. Ah, yes. Yes. Good evening, uh, Dr. Padma Gondapna. And uh, I, I would like to thank Dr. Padma Gondapna and the SLMA and Dr. Red Kajayati sir for giving this opportunity uh, to do the presentation. Well, there's short time, but I will do a, uh, try to do my best uh, in this presentation. So my, the topic given is the food safety regulatory mechanisms in Sri Lanka. Actually, I am the director of uh, Environment of Health, Occupational Health and Food Safety in the uh, Ministry of Health. And this small, wait a moment. Uh, okay, now okay. Because the screen is covering my view. Yes. So there is a food debt, food control administration unit in Sri Lanka because we are we have the food debt. There is 1918 uh, number 26, the Sri Lankan food debt. We know that it is very little old, so we need a revision in the uh, process. And the chief food authority is the director general of health services. Under him, food control administration unit is the focal point for the Ministry of Health. But we are the, our duty is to ensure food safety of the country and the, our unit. But uh, we think that food safety is not only ours, it's everyone's business to ensure. Yes. We work with the different stakeholders. The Sri Lanka Standard Institute, SLSI, Customs, Agriculture, Animal Production Department, Import and Export Control Department, Plant Quarantine Services, Tea Board, uh, Register of Pesticides, Department of Fisheries, uh, FAO, Codex Alimentarius, UN Agencies, and Universities. The food debt and its regulations. At the moment, we have 30 plus regulations under the food debt and lot, some more to come. This, all the legal actions related to food safety carried out by the authorized officers under the umbrella of this food debt and its regulations. The food control activities, which are conducted by FCAU or Food Control Administration Unit can be div divided into broadly into three areas. One area is the food co import control. This is what uh, it came into the uh, field in the uh, today, today's other stage, and uh, we speak most about this food control, food import control, and food export control. Here, I will explain. We issue health certificate for certain foods, for the, all the foods, and uh, food packing materials uh, to some countries, and also the domestic food control. These three areas uh, we work. Uh, to ensure the food safety of the uh, citizens of Sri Lanka. When you go, go to importing food, we have a 
we, we have a very limited number of staff because we are working with uh, uh, about uh, 25 food and drug inspectors in our unit because about 12 are working in this import food section and they do these control activities through the inspection of documents. They inspect the food and they go to the, actually I have visited these places and they go to the containers and they open and there is test and they are necessary, they take food samples and they do sampling according to the plan given to us, and they send them for analysis. We do the sampling in we have divided these foods into three levels, the high risk, medium risk, and low risk. The high risk foods are definitely uh, each and every container will be uh, inspected. And when you go to the belly rollers, rollers, a sample may be inspected. So here I would like to mention three things. One is the coconut oil consignment, because all these, all the coconut oil consignments, actually in 2000, um, we, we were getting coconut oil for a long time. We have started to do the coconut oil aflatoxin levels, aflatoxin levels in 2018. And at that time, we didn't get much uh, coconut oil consignments, very limited. That is not to, mostly not to sell in the market, but they are to uh, used by the popular companies. In 2020, the government decision to export uh, coconut products, including coconut oil and this, uh, uh, various other products, uh, they realized that we are going to, and, and also they did, took a decision to uh, not to promote vegetable oils. So at that uh, actual palm oil, and then palm oil. So then at that time, they want to fill the gap of requirements of oils by the uh, Sri Lankans. So they, the government has taken a decision to allow imports of coconut oil. And also they reduce the taxes on coconut oil and uh, the difference between the coconut oil and the palm oil were very big. So then the industry started importing coconut oil. That is in 2020, October line. From there onward, we used to test each and every container for aflatoxin and standards. And in, in addition to that, since 2018 or 17, we are checking all the, even before that, chili, no, aflatoxin is checked by 2018 or 17, yes. Chili consignment, all the consignments were tested. And also, we don't go for the aflatoxin in a fish, but we go to check arsenic and uh, heavy metals and other things in the fish. So we also do random surveillance and special activities. The export food control unit. We have a separate unit for this. We issue export certificate uh, and uh, issued on request. And FCO will certify that the food is fit for human consumption. For this process, we do two things. We inspect the factory and we check the samples where necessary. Because we, uh, we, need, we certify all the, or register all the companies by visit and visit them by our staff about the good management DMP and other uh, good manufacturing facility, facility uh, steps they are taking under their standards. And we have a checklist for that. And we go, uh, our, and after that, we get the samples and some samples were analyzed and we use to uh, issue this certificate. And then domestic food control. Actually we work or we depend on the provincial health people because provinces, in the provinces we have food and drug inspectors about, about 60 in all the districts and around 100,800 public health inspectors and uh, in 354 medical office of health areas. So we depend on them to implement the food tech. Uh, 
I agree with uh, Dr. Professor Samarajiva that they are working with uh, very difficult difficulty because they have to cover up work during the uh, dengue, dengue time or the COVID uh, epidemic. They have to work hard. But uh, recently we were having a review with the, one of the districts and we found that not as we said, but they were more active than earlier in some MOH officers once the COVID outbreaks of came because their argument is they are free from other clinics. And they were presentations and they, they presented their achievements. And these regional directors of health services, because they are, I worked as in two districts, are to supervise and coordinate food safety at district level. Because that's the duty of the regional director of health services. It is included his duty list to supervise and uh, this coordinate and uh, facilitate their work. And at the moment, this domestic food control, we have included uh, following, uh, we have included registration of food premises regulation. That was a new one because that was came to effect fully, fully came to effect on the 1st January of uh, this year. So now they are in the process of registration of all food premises. And for that, they usually they pay the public inspectors, they do the food premises inspection. Maybe they are not going to visit the food for this purpose itself, because they said that they are going to do it. If they go over the dengue work, they do the same thing, because they can do the inspection at the same time. And they do the routine food sampling and legal actions. Because if I go back to 2019 information, the data we have, because we lack some of the most of this data, that says about 20, close to 28,000 samples were taken during the year by the public health inspectors. But even with COVID, about 10,000 samples were taken by the public health inspectors uh, during 2020 a lot more information to become, because at that time it may be a little higher. And they participated in national food surveillance, which done on 2018 last time, because after that uh, it was not done actually because uh, the COVID situation in the country. And we do other national level activities too. We do the regulatory activities. COVID, we are the contact point for COVID. And one more. And national review meeting, we before the national review meetings on the food act activities by the public health staff. And we improve analytical capacity through uh, making the accredited laboratories, making these lab accredited throughout the country and advocacy awareness and food safety week. Capacity building of the staff. We do water surveillance. We do iodized salt regulation activities. Bottled water registration by, done by the unit. And we have electronic information system for us. And the subject, we, many regulations have been newly formulated and many are being updated. The procedures, campaigns, and real time, because it, I will explain this. The regulation formation is not the easy procedure. We this is the we do the draft regulation in consensus with the food advisory committee. Then stakeholder comments we get uh, from the stakeholders. Then consider stakeholder comments at regulation formation committee and send the edited draft regulations to WTO, and then address the WTO concerns. Then send to legal draft and receive English version. Then regulation formation committee go through the document again and then sent to the legal department for any corrections. The draft received in single, timely length, three languages we need, according to Sri Lanka. Then we check it and regulation formation committee go through the document and send for minister's signature. This is the procedure, but it takes some time. And through this process, there are a number of uh, acts or regulations, not acts, regulations are in the pipeline. The new regulations are Transpet regulations, wheat flour fortification regulation, and several cereal and other cereal product regulations. 
and some these are new ones the updated which are in our list or the queue are labeling and advertising regulations because this is in the final stage the idealization of salt this is also a revision uh, it's going bottle of packaged drinking water natural mineral water this is in the uh, final stage fat and oil fish and fishery products meat and meat products milk and milk product regulation mycotoxin regulation the mycotoxin regulation was there and due to this present uh, situation we have to take it up little early so now we have the existing regulation food labeling regulations in 1993 according to this the is the level what professor amarji said that the 30 parts per billion for this coconut oil came through this regulation but if you go through that the milk and milk products one part per billion any food intended for children one part per billion but any other food came 30 billions 30 parts per billion through this only the uh, level came for the uh, coconut oils and the fourth coming mycotoxins and regulations much more comprehensive and many kind of mycotoxins has been included other than aflatoxin such as octadoxin patulin dioxinivernilol etc because this is not only for the mycotoxins we included others also because the, the completeness because that's what we are little delayed so uh, we hope that our uh, regulations can be out because all the process has been over we are left with uh, one more steps one or two steps so in one month time as the, the country is uh, die in need of this regulation so we get the legal draft will help us we can come out with the regulation very soon and here all the relevant food items has been included not only coconut oil in this regulation and the levels has been updated to align with the eu and codex database because we uh, the levels are more stringent than the existing as an example the level for coconut oil come to 10 and we and i want to mention that we work hard on this our unit on regulations and we had stakeholders me recent stakeholders meeting on tea coffee and cocoa and milk mycotoxin regulation and transport regulation were done but these most of the meetings we had or the regulation committee meeting we had through online systems because the situation in the country was not suitable to have physically uh, physical meetings so we had online meetings to fulfill the requirement of the country so now we are in the process of uh, taking the next steps on these regulations and I, we hope that the present regulation on mycotoxins will come in one month uh, time also very closely and even other regulations will be out very soon we are in the process of updating and revising the other circulars too other other regulations too so thank you very much this is what our unit do uh, to ensure the food safety of the sri, uh, sri lanka but i have to explain more and i think the time doesn't permit for the uh, time permitted for me uh, not is not enough so i thank you again for slm giving this opportunity to explain the process of uh, uh, safety control food control unit and and uh, uh, dr renuka jati sir for coordinating this activity thank you very much um, thank you very much dr sirivadana uh, for that very uh, interesting presentation and also to professor samarajeeva for enlightening us on many aspects of aflatoxin that uh, we were not familiar with Uh, as uh, 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 I mean, explanations that uh, I personally uh, learned a lot on aflatoxin and liver during my medical career. But then, in a clinical setting, we never experienced until this problem, recent problem, uh, with regard to contamination of aflatoxin and coconut oil, was discussed uh, in uh, the uh, 
in the uh, uh, Sri Lankan community. So now uh, the uh, if I, what I noticed was that we, during the presentation of Professor Samaljeeva, it was mentioned that this routine checks for aflatoxin had ha, had happened uh, even in the recent past. Uh, when the stuff was uh, uh, imported from several other countries as well. And there had been instances where the uh, aflatoxin was found to be uh, uh, at upper level than what is expected. So why was that? It's only in this time that this uh, whole, uh, the, uh, the problem was discussed and uh, it uh, creates sort of so much of uh, unrest among community. Why was only in that time, this time that uh, it happened with regard to coconut oil? Was it because of the uh, size or uh, as it was a huge consignment that we received or was there any other particular reason? Well, to my mind, it is a question of a bit of politics and bit of business because the business community in Sri Lanka yeah. felt that the arrival of a lot of coconut oil is a threat to them because when you look at the first people who went out and talked it in the public media, they are people from the, from the business community of the local business community who were affected. So even they knew about it earlier, they didn't say. I remember on the very first talk that was given by a local businessman, he categorically said, Sri Lankan oils are not at all contaminated. We are totally free of aflatoxins and all this is uh, international. So, so it's, it's politics partly. Thank you. All right. Thanks. I think that you answered the question very clearly. And then uh, 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 there's a question actually. Uh, there is uh, 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 um, uh, a person, a doctor who has joined, is interested in knowing the concentration of sodium hydroxide uh, that you use in chemical refining process. Yeah, it is published. It is uh, something like 0.3%. And then also we have to combine that with the temperature treatment and the duration. So depending on the level of aflatoxins that is present in the food, we may have to increase it or we may have to reduce it. So if you look at the publication I, I put on the, on the slide for the peanuts, they were using 0.3, but there was another publication later which discussed at length the variations that we could bring in. If that gentleman can send me an email to my address, smrje at gmail.com, I'll be happy to reply further with the relevant data to the person. Uh, thank you very much for Samaji for that very uh, comprehensive uh, response. The, uh, from, the, uh, um, from Dr. Sirivadana, I would like to know what that now, I mean, what is the level that we are going to accept as acceptable for Sri Lanka or naplatoxin? Yes, I can. Uh, the level according to the regulations in Sri Lanka and the Food Act, the level accepted in Sri Lanka is 30. 30, 30, but, yeah. yeah, 30. But so, Amma, uh, yeah, with but regard the, to your new one that would be coming up, yeah, uh, the, the coming up regulations it will be 10 for coconut oils, right? right. 10, 10 parts per billion. That will be the in and uh, if you permit to me, I would like to mention this uh, the your best questions to Professor Samarthi because yes. the, before uh, December thirty first we have checked two hundred ninety three uh, containers and there we have found seventy three containers above the level of thirty. Right. And after January 3rd, January 1st, we have tested 323 containers up to March 31st. And we, there are only 22 containers were positive. So the, as a percentage, before to end December, it was 25%. And after that, it was 6.8. Because I think that our uh, uh, steps to reship this, uh, the recommendation for reships uh, may have may, may have changed the uh, global uh, trade uh, the, the traders to send the good varieties to Sri Lanka because that's that I hope that uh, our levels are six point eight percent after uh, January first. 
So uh, what you mean is this was detected before 1st of January, was it? Correct, yes. We were detecting them since October uh, last year. All right, all right. And then you said that there's other types of toxins. Now in the new regulations, there will be provision for you to check for uh, ocratoxin and all the yes. other minor uh, sort of uh, the toxins that are yes. in minute quantities. So do yes. we have facilities to check all those toxins? Actually, we don't have that facilities at the moment, but we are in the We hope that we can develop these facilities in our labs because we are our one of our uh, aims or the goals are to have uh, good laboratory system in Sri Lanka because we do, we need to have some reference laboratory in Sri Lanka. Uh, otherwise, uh, very different. We have seven laboratories. We know that approved laboratory, but we have we should have a good laboratory system in Sri Lanka. So I hope that we can come out with a good system uh, to check this in. But we make these regulations to make it complete regulations because uh, after that we cannot add very difficult to add again and again. So we hope that it is it is in par with the international regulations. We go with the codex or sometimes if not at available European Union levels. Uh, now uh, uh, I will understand that you check for uh, you check for aplatoxin because it's, I mean, for toxins, but at the same time, you said that you are going to check on trans fat levels. Now, if we are going to check on trans fat levels, do we check for the, I mean, do we consider at least on the saturated, uh, uh, the fatty acid contents that is there uh, in these oils? Uh, yes, because our, our this standards were checked, but this coconut oil and the, all the palm oils, were test for the standards because the, we have uh, uh, the, uh, the cell SI has developed some standards. We yeah. have adopted them and we are yeah. going according to the standards and we are checking them. So, all right, all right, all right. All right. Uh, I think uh, that uh, gives us sort of a fairly uh, comprehensive account on what is happening. Uh, uh, I mean, but the uh, uh, the whole story with regard to aflatoxin and uh, or any other mycotoxins and food, and also with regard to aflatoxin and coconut oil, and also the uh, the process of uh, the regulations that's happening at the uh, uh, ministerial level. Uh, uh, I think we have had a sort of fairly uh, comprehensive, fruitful, uh, uh, very informative discussion. On, on this mycotoxins and human health. I'm very thankful to Dr. Renuka Jayatissa for her interest and also to the uh, expert committee for non-communicable diseases of the Sri Lanka Medical Association for taking up this issue and also organizing this webinar on behalf of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. I'm very thankful to Dr. Prof. Upali uh, Samarajiva for his uh, sort of excellent uh, account on uh, this subject and for enlightening us on all the minor points uh, that are of relevance to aflatoxin and to uh, uh, our own uh, uh, Dr. Tilak Srivadana, who is an administrator who is very familiar to us uh, and who's there to help us with uh, all the administrative work that whenever that we are in need. Uh, I'm very thankful to him as well for spending his valuable time and sharing his experience uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the doctors that who have joined online. Uh, at, uh, finally, let me thank all uh, who join online uh, with this SLMA webinar series. Thank you very much for all of you. Uh, 